Hello, uh, welcome back to Cracking Cryptic, where I'm going to take you through uh, a viewer requested puzzle. Uh, this is described as being uh, from an, an app on a phone um, set to expert level. And the viewer in question says that they can make a lot of progress and then resolve the final situation by guessing that they wanted to understand whether there was a logical way of making progress. So on the screen there, you can see that the the black numbers were the given numbers originally, so if you want to try the puzzle yourselves, just, just note down the black numbers and go from there. And the blue numbers are where you can get to without employing any, any difficult logical techniques, sim simply by going through the puzzles and eliminating, as you would do in the very most basic sense, and you arrive at this situation. And then we have to consider what to do next. Now, there are, there are two ways uh, that I've noticed of making making progress from here. Um, the first and perhaps uh, the more difficult way is to spot that there are, or there's at least one forcing chain that we can we can use. And the, the, probably the easiest way to look at that is to focus in on this square here, and to notice that this square obviously has two possibilities. It could be a nine. Now, if it's a nine that's going to eliminate a 9 as a candidate from this cell. If it's not a 9, what happens? Well, if it's not a 9, it must be a 4. And if it's a 4, this cell would have to be a 5. This cell would therefore have to be a 4. This cell would have to be a 9. Therefore, this cell would have to be a 6. And this cell would have to be a 9. So whether this is a 9 or not, this cell can never be a 9, because either this cell is a 9, and therefore we eliminate the 9 here, or this cell is a 9, and we eliminate the 9 here. Now, that's one way you could go about doing this, this puzzle. Another way is based on um, this principle called the bug principle. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about what that is and how it would instantly allow you to just simply by looking at this grid immediately uh, deduce something about the only candidate left in the grid or the only cell in the grid that has three possibilities. So you can see if you study it carefully every cell here has just two possibilities left except for this one and it turns out that when this situation arises in a Sudoku, we can actually immediately go to this cell and know that one of the answers is, is correct. Now, how can we do that? Well, firstly, we have to revisit the principle of uniqueness. So I just want to briefly touch on it so that we can remind ourselves of the principles of what happens in a Sudoku that has a single unique solution. So let's go right back to uh, maybe this sort of situation here and look at a, si a situation we've looked at before which this is a um, this is a problem scenario in a Sudoku so if you arrived at a complete grid apart from these four cells here and the candidates left were just the numbers three and nine in each of these cells hopefully it's obvious to all of you certainly those of you who have been watching the channel for the last few months that this this puzzle has no unique solution because Let's just say I pick the number 3 here. If, if this is a 3, this cell will be a 3. This cell will be a 9, and this cell will be a 9. But there is no way of disambiguating that solution, where this is a 3 and this is a 3, from the solution where this is a 9 and this is a 9. Because all that happens is that the 9s and the 3s switch places. Nothing else changes in the puzzle. So there is no way for the puzzle's internal logic to disambiguate between whether the 3 is intended to be here or whether the 9 is intended to be here. So we would know that if we reached this sort of end game in a Sudoku, we've made a mistake. Now we can go a little bit further than that. So now let's take a look at this uh, extension of that earlier example. It may look more complicated, but actually it's exactly the same principle as before. So now we need to focus on each row, each column, and each 3x3 three three block. And if we do that and carefully consider the, the options remaining, so let's imagine every single cell uh, other than the ones, these ones are, you know, are filled in the final solution, we can see that there are two possibilities for each number. So let's just look, for example, at 
row three, you can see the threes can go in two positions, the ones in two positions, the fours in two positions, and the eights in two positions. And you can check it, but for every row, column, and box, this is true. Now, believe it or not, the you know this puzzle also uh, has uh, a problem with uniqueness. And what we find when we arrive at these situations where there are two possible places for every remaining number in the grid is that either the solution will, either there just will not be a solution or you'll find a solution where you can just flip the digits as we did with the X-Wing and reach an equivalent solution but without being able to disambiguate uh, from the internal logic of the puzzle, which was the intended solution after all. So let's just go through it. Let's let's imagine for a moment this is a three. The moment we pick uh, one of the possibilities in these end game scenarios like this one, we'll find that the whole puzzle instantly resolves itself because there are only two possibilities for each open cell. Uh, once we make a selection, we actually instantly resolve all of the remaining. So you can see going through, it's going to be a 7, a 1, a 7, and a 4. And you might think, well, hey, we've done the puzzle. There's, you know, we've finished it, no problem. Well, no, you haven't. Now, this is quite hard to visualize in some ways, but it, it is possible to do it. Um, and I think it's rather than just going back to where we were and flipping it round and showing you there's another solution, it's worth just trying to work it through in our minds and think about what's going to happen if, for example, I flip uh, this 3 and 8 round. So what, what happens precisely to the puzzle if rather than us choosing a 3 here, we choose this to be an 8? Well, you can see immediately, obviously, the 3 moves down here and this 3 and 4 simply flip round the other, in the other way. That's all that happens. So the 4 moves down here. Now the moment the 4 moves down here, this cell, which previously could have been a 1 or a 4, now has to be a 1. So this one, it just flips its parity, if you like. This 8 has to come down here, so we would have 1, 8, 4, rather than the position shown. But you can see that the moment we do that, all that happens down here is that this 7 and 1 flip round, and this 7 and 4 flip round. So, in fact, this puzzle does not have a unique solution, and we, we, we have a big problem wherever we run into a situation when, where in every row, column, and box, the remaining possible numbers can go in exactly two positions in all of those three categories. That leads to a non-unique uh, situation which, which we know because we're only solving good Sudoku puzzles is not going to be correct and we can apply that uniqueness assumption to make more progress. So now let's revisit the actual puzzle that we were looking at before that was sent in by one of our viewers and let's focus in now on this 569 and we can use that principle that we've just uh, been discussing to immediately rule out two options from this cell. So pause the video if you need to think about how to do that. But the simplest way to think about it, I think, is let's pick the two numbers here that give us the, the so-called bug problem. So if we pick that, the, if we eliminate the nine as a candidate here, let's look at what we're left with. Now we have a situation where in row nine, there are two possible places for each of the remaining three numbers. In column six, there are two possible positions for the remaining three numbers. And in this box, there are two possible positions for the remaining three numbers. So if the options for this cell were five and six, we have run into a uniqueness problem. Therefore, we can rule out five and six as options from this uh, from this cell. This cell has to be a nine. It must be nine, and that will now resolve itself. And I shall just uh, show you that hopefully now we can see the puzzle resolving itself in a in a way that leads to a unique solution. Nine, six, four, nine, four, five. 
9, 4, and 9. And I think if you study this arrangement, what you'll find is that we, we don't have any of the uh, uniqueness problems that we were running into before. And I suppose one way to confirm that is that we found the forcing chain from the 9, if you remember, where we, we, we knew that whether this cell was a 9 or not, this cell could not be a 9, and that we've ended up correctly with the 5 appearing in this cell. So two ways to the same solution. I hope uh, something a bit different today, interesting, and um, we'll see you again next time on Cracking the Cryptic.